All right. Good evening, everyone. It's good to see you again this week. I hope you're having a good week and everything is going well for you. Things are going well for me and my family. We're all getting a little bit of stir crazy, as I'm sure all of you are, and um, missing our church family. Hope everything is going okay with you. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. Again, we're going to spend about a half hour in a study of the Gospel of John. We're in the 17th chapter, if you want to turn your Bibles there. It was actually kind of nice this week. I forgot exactly where I left off, and I was able to go and look at the recording. So I know right where I left off this time. We're going to pick up in the passage which we were studying in John 17, beginning of verse 9, and reading through uh, verse uh, 17. I think I have 16 on your screen, but it's through verse 17, and uh, we'll pick up where we left off. So let's go ahead and, and read this passage. Jesus is praying to the Father, don't forget, and he says, I pray for them, meaning his disciples. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may believe, uh, excuse me, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Okay, I believe we had talked about verses uh, 9 and 10 and we talked about how, <clears throat> excuse me, how Christ can be glorified in us and we should do all that we can to glorify Christ and the way that we behave, the way that we conduct ourselves. And I said we were going to pick up at verse 11 that where Jesus here mentions that he desires a unity. Um, at the end of verse 11, he says that they may be one as we are, talking about his disciples. Now, um, I said we were going to, to focus in on unity and that unity is a, a probably if you were to pick one primary theme for this prayer, unity is, is it. We're going to pick up and talk a little bit more about unity in the next section because really starting in verse 21 is where Jesus focuses in on unity. But uh, he prays for the unity of believers and notice that he says that that unity, he says that they may be one as we are one, talking about himself and the Father. He desires the unity that believers have to be the same type of unity that he has with the Father. So keep that in mind as we come back to it. Uh, Jesus here, he talks about those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition. That obviously is a reference to his disciples and that all of them had remained faithful except the son of perdition, which obviously is a reference to Judas, uh, who betrayed him. And Jesus reminds us that, you know, those things occurred, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. The, the betrayal of Jesus was predicted in the Old Testament. It was a it was a prophecy. It certainly was not something that caught Jesus off guard or that he did not know was going to happen. Um, going on now, we're going to drop down a little bit. He says in verse 14, I've given, you, given them your word. The world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And then he says, I don't pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. So when Jesus says that his followers, that the disciples are not of the world, he doesn't mean that we're not part of the world. He, say, he says it in the prayer, Father, I'm not saying take them out of the world, but that um, we should be kept from the evil one. Well, the evil one's a reference to the devil, to Satan. And much like in Jesus's model prayer, 
um, when he was teaching his disciples to pray, um, he prayed that, you know, we'd be delivered from temptation and, and that um, God shield us from the evil one, from the devil. And Jesus here is praying that for his disciples. That's something that we should pray for for one another every day. We should pray that um, we, our brothers and sisters, be protected from the devil, from the evil one, and uh, that God providentially will help to do that and, and watch over them. Um, but the idea of not being of the world really leads to the idea that he gets to here at the end of this passage they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So there's a, a lot that can be said about verse 17. I've preached sermons, series of sermons on John 17 and 17. Um, two primary topics you can study from that passage is the idea of sanctification and what sanctification is, what it means, how it occurs, and also about truth. What is truth? Well, Jesus here tells us in this prayer that God's word is truth and that that truth is what sanctifies us, whatever it means to be sanctified. So I thought we would spend a little bit of time thinking about the topic of sanctification, what it is and how it occurs. Um, those who are watching this, who are members of the church here in Streetsboro, know that within the last year I did a series of lessons on sanctification. So for our members who are watching this, this will sound familiar, hopefully, and um, you'll, you'll recognize some of this same information. But we want to think a little bit about the idea of sanctification. It has something to do with not being of the world. Jesus says that he wasn't of the world, his disciples weren't of the world. So it really helps us to understand what that word sanctify means, to understand what he meant uh, when he said that his disciples were not of the world. So what is sanctification? Um, the word sanctify and saint come from the same word in the Greek language. Hagios in the Greek language is the word for a holy one. And sanctify is the, the verb form, hagiadzo, hagios, hagiadzo. And so sanctify is to sanctify something is to make something holy. A holy one is hagios. To make someone holy is to sanctify. Um, so it, it means to make holy. Uh, it means to declare something to be holy. It has the idea of cleansing, washing, and purifying something. Okay, to cleanse, wash, or purify and also the idea of, of setting someone or something apart for a purpose. And when we're talking about sanctification in a religious sense, we're talking about a divine purpose, okay, to be set apart for a divine service or work of the Lord. So that's the basic definition of sanctification, three things, to be set apart for a divine service, consecrate is a, is a word that goes with that, uh, to be declared to be holy, and also to be cleansed, purified, or washed. Those three ideas that go with sanctification. Well, the next question is, okay, um, that is what sanctification is. How does one become sanctified? Well, our passage here in verse 17 tells us one of the ways that we are sanctified. Jesus says, Sanctify them by your truth. The Christian is sanctified uh, by the word of God. When we hear and obey the word of God, we then are purified, set apart, consecrated for a divine purpose. Um, there are other things, though, in the scriptures that are said to sanctify us and things that are required for sanctification. So I thought maybe we would think a little bit about a few of those things. So first of all, um, if you're looking in your Bible, you can. It's Hebrews 10, verses 10 to 14, or we can just read off the screen together. Here the Hebrew writer says, By that will, talking about the will of God, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. 
And now he talks about uh, the Old Testament priesthood. He says, Every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, talking now about Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, for by one offering, Jesus' is offering of himself, he has perfected those who are being sanctified. And so we have here the statement made that we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus. So no sanctification for mankind is possible apart from the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. He died on the cross so that we might be perfected, that we might be washed, we might be purified and set apart for service to him. Um, that goes right along with uh, what the Hebrew writer says a little bit down the chapter in verse 29 when he says, of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace. So there the Hebrew writer in passing mentions that when a person tramples the Son of God underfoot when he becomes unfaithful and goes back into uh, a life of sin, that he's trampled the Son of God underfoot, and he's counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified an unholy thing. And so he that there points out it's the blood of Jesus also sanctifies us. So the offering of Jesus, his blood, is what makes our sanctification possible. The scriptures also make it clear that the Holy, Holy Spirit excuse me, plays part uh, in our sanctification as well. In 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13, Paul says, We are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. And then 1 Peter 1 and verse 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. So the Holy Spirit plays a part in our sanctification as well. Several times there, Paul says uh, sanctification of the Holy Spirit. So he plays a part in our sanctification, in our washing, our purifying, and are being set apart for a divine purpose, the Holy Spirit plays a part. You go on, um, also, we're said to be sanctified by faith in Christ, Acts 26 and verse 18. Here, this is um, when Jesus is sort of giving Paul his marching orders uh, when he, after he obeyed the gospel. And he says that Paul's job was to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who are sanctified, notice, by faith in me. So we're sanctified by faith in Christ. So all those things are said to be necessary for our sanctification and to play a role in our sanctification, what the, the sacrificing of the body of Christ, the blood of Jesus, the word of God plays a part, the Holy Spirit plays a part. So how does that all work? Well, putting all this together, first of all, as I've said, our sanctification is made possible by the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Without that, our sanctification is not possible. When we develop a faith in Jesus, uh, we believe in Jesus according to his teachings, the teachings of the Bible. The truth sanctifies us. Now, where do we get the truth? Well, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, okay? The Holy Spirit is the one who revealed truth to mankind. And so that's how the Holy Spirit plays a part in our sanctification. He has revealed truth to us. And so when we learn truth, when we, we open God's Word and study it and come to believe it, the Holy Spirit is sanctifying us. He plays a part in our sanctification. So the truth comes from God's word, from the sword of the Spirit. But then also there's something required of us, okay? And, and we have to, if you will, I like to say, come into contact with the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus sanctifies us, but we have to contact that blood. And that 
is really set forth in the scriptures as something that we do when we're baptized. So the scriptures tell us that the blood of Jesus is what washes us and makes us clean. And remember, that's one of the meanings or part of the meaning of sanctified, to wash or to make clean. So we have uh, Revelation 1 and verse 5 that says um, to the last part of the verse, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So we're washed from our sins in the blood of Jesus. Okay, so the blood of Jesus plays a part in our sanctification, as we've already said, but also baptism is said to wash us. And, and these are passages that I love to put together. Revelation 1, 5, and then Acts 22 and verse 16, where the apostle Paul was told by Ananias, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So we wash our sins away. Our sins are washed away when we're baptized. That passage is so so important because many in the religious world teach a, a false plan of salvation. You'll hear people say, you know, just pray this prayer with me and everything will be okay. God will forgive you. And well, prayer is wonderful and great, but we have to pray the right things. And, and this prayer of the sinner's prayer is not found anywhere in the scriptures. Paul, at the time that this these words were spoken to him in Acts 22, 16, was a believer he was a believer who had spent time in prayer for three days and fasting. He wanted to obey, but his sins were not yet washed away. Prayer couldn't wash away his sins. It took obedience, and that obedience was in the form of baptism where his sins were washed away. So going back again to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22, the Hebrew writer says, Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, notice, in our bodies washed with pure water, okay? Our hearts are sprinkled from an evil conscience when our bodies are washed with pure water. In other words, when we submit to the act of baptism. That is how uh, we come into contact with the blood of Jesus that then washes away our sins. When we are baptized, we are put into Christ, Galatians 3 and verse 27. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And when we are in Christ, we have sanctification. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 2. Paul says to the church of Corinth, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Notice, called to be saints. That's what it means to be sanctified. You are a saint. And so anyone who is a faithful Christian, a faithful servant of Jesus Christ is a saint. And um, Paul uses that term to talk about the normal, average, everyday Christian, not some kind of super Christian. So... That is how one becomes sanctified. Um, the offering of the body of Jesus, his blood washes our sins away, but we have to believe, we have to have faith in Jesus, which we acquire through the word that the Holy Spirit gave us. And when we are obedient to that word and are immersed, baptized into the body of Christ, the blood of Jesus then washes our sins away. And we are saints. We are holy people, sanctified people, people who have been set apart for a divine purpose. Before we move on um, from the topic of sanctification, I just wanted to think a little bit also about um, is sanctification a process or a position, or is it both? Is it a process or a position? Um, is, is, is sanctification something that God has to continually do to us? Or is it like a one-time thing? When I obey the gospel and I'm sanctified, is that, is that all there is? I mean, is it a one-time event? And I think the answer is really both, okay? It is a one-time event, but in another way of looking at it, it's a continuing process. And here's what I mean. When one obeys the gospel, at that point, He's been sanctified, okay? And by obey the gospel, I mean, you know, hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, continue to live faithfully. That individual is 
sanctified. That's a position. That's a declaration that God makes. You are holy. You are set apart for divine purpose. And um, you know, we think about 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18, where really Paul is encouraging the Corinthians to be sanctified, to, to come out of the world. And, and he sort of puts together some scriptures from the Old Testament and he quotes them and he says, Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. So that's the idea of sanctification. Once you obey the gospel, yeah, it's a, it's, you're there. You are a sanctified individual. However, I believe it's also a process when you look at it in the sense of uh, purification or a washing. Um, sanctification means to be washed from your sins. And, and as a Christian, obviously, we strive to remain sin-free. Uh, it's our goal to be sinless, knowing that we'll never get there. But we, ought, we, we aim for that. We, we should work for that. And so we have passages like uh, James 1 and verse 27, where pure and undefiled religion for God and the Father is this. It involves visiting the widows and the orphans in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. That's part of true religion, keeping ourselves unspotted, keeping ourselves pure and clean and holy uh, in service to the Lord. John also said in 1 John 3, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him, notice, purifies himself just as he is pure. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever ha sins has neither seen him nor knows him. So there, John says, whoever abides in him does not sin. Now, John is not contradicting himself. Earlier in the gospel, in that first John, um, he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. OK, so he's not saying that the Christian never sins. He's saying here, whoever abides in him does not continue in sin. And that's brought out in the Greek language with the tense of the verbs. Um, the Christian doesn't go on sinning. So there there is a continual effort there to remain pure and to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. However, we know that as Christians, from time to time, we slip up. And some, sometimes more than from time to time, we slip up. And we, as, as you will, we, we soil ourselves. We get our garments dirty, so to speak. And, and we need to be washed or cleansed again. Um, remember the statement of Peter uh, when he talks about this in 2 Peter 2, 20-22. He talks about people who have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and then are again entangled in them and overcome. So he's talking about a, a, a Christian who has again become entangled in the world and overcome by the pollutions or the sin in the world. Peter says, um, among other things here, that it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from it. But he describes it as a sow. Uh, it's like a sow that had been washed returning to the, to the mud and getting dirty again. And so we as Christians, you know, we've been purified. We've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And there are times when we get ourselves dirty again with sin. And so in that instance, you could look at sanctification as a continuing process in that we continually need that blood of Jesus to wash away our sins. And again, John alludes to that in 1 John 1 and verse 7, when he says, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And that word for cleanse there, it means keep on cleansing. It's the, it's the present tense of that verb. So it's something that he continues to do. He continues to cleanse us from our sin. The Christian walks in the light. We try to live according to the teachings of Jesus. And when we stumble, when we fail, 
we continue to walk in the light. We repent of that sin. We ask God's forgiveness and the blood of Jesus cleanses us of that sin. And so if you look at it in that sense, sanctification is a process and that, you know, we're continually being sanctified um, by the blood of Jesus. So in a way, it's a one time event, but also in another way, uh, it's a process that continues as long as we continue to serve our Lord. OK, um, let's go on. We have a little bit of time left. We'll pick up now at uh, verse 18. Uh oh, OK, I didn't put this passage in here. So you have to look at your Bible. But uh, in John chapter 17, uh, beginning at verse 18 now, we're going to read 18 through 23. Here, uh, Jesus in his prayer says, As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect and one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Okay, so first of all, Jesus says in verse 18, I have um, sent them into the world talking about his disciples. So we think about, you know, the Great Commission, Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20 here, where Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, uh, baptizing them in the name of the uh, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so that we call that the Great Commission. He says, I've sent them into the world, okay? Okay. Um, that is part of, of what Jesus has done. And um, you think about the word disciple, okay? The word disciple means a follower or a learner, a pupil, a student. And the word apostle means one who is sent. And so really, the disciples became the apostles. And really that occurred, uh, in my mind, when Jesus sent them, okay? Because the word apostle means one who is sent. I think I said that. And so when he sends them into the world, those disciples now become the apostles. Now, in one sense, um, all Christians are apostles today. Now, bear with me. I think you know where I'm going with this. Uh, in, the, in the sense of being sent into the world, we're, we're sent. We're told to go, okay, into the world and preach the gospel. So in that sense, all Christians are sent. We are apostles. However, there are no, I guess you would say, capital A apostles uh, in the world today. Um, you know, there were the, the 12 apostles and then the 13th also being the Apostle Paul. Um, they were the capital A apostles, if you will. We have no apostles like that today, obviously. They had special authority. They had the keys to the kingdom. Um, you know, to preach, and they preached and taught by inspiration. They could pass on miraculous gifts and those things. So the, the, the apostles with a capital A, there are none of those today. I remember when uh, Judas uh, killed himself, remember they, they had to choose someone to take his place. Um, this, the capital A apostles, if you will, um, they that was an office and they, they wanted to fill that office after Judas had killed himself. So you remember in Acts chapter one, when they did that, um, Peter there, he says in verses 21 and 22 of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to the day he was taken up from us. One of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And, and, you know, they end up, choosing Matthias there to replace Judas. So um, there were some qualifications. You, just no one in particular, I mean, this individual had to be one who 
was there with the men to see the ministry of Jesus and also witness his resurrection. And uh, Matthias was the one who was chosen. Now, we know that Paul, um, he was a witness of the resurrection. He saw the resurrected Christ, but obviously he did not meet that first requirement of having been with Jesus all during his ministry. But Paul even, you know, he describes himself as an apostle that was born out of due time in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 8. Okay, there, I want to just briefly mention what Jesus says in verse 19, and then we'll be done for the day. But uh, in verse 19, Jesus says, for their, sake, for their sakes, I sanctify myself. Well, what does that mean? If sanctify means to purify, to make, to cleanse, you know, to make holy, how is it possible that Jesus sanctified himself? Wasn't he already cleansed and holy and pure? Well, um, yeah, okay, Jesus had no sins. In that sense, he did not need to be sanctified. He was already pure and holy and, and, and um, cleansed. He had no sins. Okay. If he wasn't cleansed, he was pure. Um, in this sense... Um, the word sanctify, it has more to do with the meaning of consecrating or devoting to a purpose, okay? And so I believe what Jesus is saying here is he's devoting himself to death. He's devoting himself to go to the cross and die for the sins of mankind so that his disciples might have sanctification. You know, his death was necessary before their sanctification was possible. So I think when he says, I sanctify myself, he's saying, I'm devoting myself to this purpose, to this cause. Uh, I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to die for the sins of mankind. Okay, so that is, um, we've gone through verse 19. We will pick up here next week when we continue to study. And we're going to talk a little bit about unity now, um, because again, that's a primary theme of this prayer. And I think that's because Jesus being who he was knew that that was going to be one of the primary problems, issues among his followers. And he was right. It is. And yet the scriptures are so clear on the teaching of unity and what God desires from us. So again, we, we thank you for your attention. Hopefully this has been helpful and enjoyable for you. And Lord willing, we'll see you again next week. God bless.